So let's focus first on the co-founder team building. So who's going to go along to that journey? Uh, at the very core team. Then there are separately those teams that join later, there's those who support you along the way, but who's going to be on the core core journey? And, uh, and if we look at from the, the team uh, rationale, uh, when acting as an individual entrepreneur, basically this is how it feels like, this is also how it looks like for the most of the, the, the people. It's basically uh, individual and the business are almost uh, inseparable, separable, and they are kind of like one and the same. And it's very hard to build a business in in this context because because that's that's already um, uh, the perception, and it's 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 hard to get out of that perception. Individually, mentally, men mentally, individually, plus also from uh, the external sides when they are trying to see what is the company. It gets easier when you when you have at least a separate business entity uh, that is not just a, a lifestyle entrepreneurship or free, freelancer type of activity. But if there is no co-founders, it's still not that much different. The key difference here can be that are you working in your company or are you working on your company? So are you building your company uh, from the perspective that you're building the company or are you in the company trying to build the company uh, from, from that perspective? And it's much harder to see how to grow your company when you are the company. So the co-founder team adds clearly now, uh, not only it adds perspective, dimension, to see the company from different angles and aspects because of the experience and uh, the, the skill set. Uh, it adds more resources, so now there's three times as more resources than just one individual, so it's already a big change. Uh, it can be two times or it can be four times. Um, and it also brings um, efficiency in the sense of being able to validate own concerns, questions, ideas quickly with those who also understand the context all the time uh, right away and without having to go to someone to explain what your company is about, what are you doing and so forth. Uh, that always takes time and they will never achieve similar type of perspective as your co-founders will have by default, being part of the setup. Um, so the key essence to building the team is, um, is really to find the right team for you and right team for the venture. So it's really more important than the initial idea, also from the statistical perspective, to make sure that the team is aligned for the journey and is specifically for the market and not so much about the idea. Ideas come and go, products come and go. If you're building something big, you're most likely going to have many versions and iterations of your product. You may have additional services, multiple products serving the same market along the way. Um, and uh, out of one idea, you can create a uh, hundred different versions. Uh, of combination of service product and business model, revenue model. So, so the team that is there, the point is to figure it out and make it work. So a good team can really make success even from a bad idea uh, as they learn, adapt and can find the right ideas along the way. But bad team really can't even get the good idea to work uh, unless being lucky, because they are missing this mindset of, of uh, iteration, uh, understanding the problem before individual ideas, understanding the market, and uh, understanding their role in learning and executing versus just loving their idea and trying to sell that idea to everyone who comes across. At the same time, those who are more active, those who execute more, 
are usually more lucky. So the, the more active you are, the more opportunities there will be, the more luck will also hit you. Uh, it's just the nature of how, how that works. And really, uh, the be in international by design is that this is also one aspect uh, that is specifically for those companies that come from a small home market or start from a small home market and if their ambition is anywhere to be scaling and anywhere to be global one of the key considerations can be as simple as with what language do you start your service with if it's a digital product if you are looking to, uh, to service uh, global markets you may actually want to choose directly with more international language than even consider um, starting with your own language. It's a separate consideration also if you e even support your own home language at all, if it's small, uh, because it, it adds to the, the, the workload quite significantly the more languages you have to support. So consider uh, from the market's perspective and customer's perspective uh, how do you need to reach those customers? How are you serving them? Um, and, and basically, with what language you will start. Uh, as a case example, if starting from Finland, uh, to, because progress takes time and the market opportunities also change over time, so it's also in one way it's time lost being in the market, uh, if only starting with your home market. Also, the home market validation may not be enough to validate that there is um, interest in the service and product in any other market that may be culturally very different or there is more local offering available already by that time and so forth. So it's really about looking at what is the overall market potential and how would I prioritize the home market to be there as my first target. So that is uh, about more about this uh, born global thinking. And uh, you can, as, as you look at different products online, you can clearly identify the products that are made to be available to anyone from anywhere uh, versus those that are too localized. And sometimes you can't, even if you want to buy the service, you can't buy it with your you know, foreign credit card or you can't buy it uh, because there's no delivery for your country or so forth. So we as customers perspective, we can quickly uh, identify a product uh, that may be appealing to us, but it's not available to us. So have that consideration in the very beginning. And uh, But these are all uh, tradici uh, strategy decisions, but they should be considered with uh, business rationale and not just uh, emotionally what feels easier because the earlier you also cross the international mindset thinking the more international you just are the later you're considering that we'll do that later the, in reality the harder it, the harder it gets to cross that international mindset thinking okay yeah, we have one question. Um, if you want to invest in a startup or select one to co, de to co develop, what are the key questions to evaluate the team? So, um, first of all, if you are looking to in invest, uh, it's good uh, good to remind on the on the on the core perspective of investor. So, as an investor to startups, first, as, as an asset class, it's a very high risk asset class. So, you should never think of investing into one startup. You should always think that you should invest at least 10 to 20 startups. 20 with business angel network statistics, 20 will be kind of a, a secure way to get a certain level of uh, return to your investment. So it always should be a portfolio strategy. At the same time, investing into startups, uh, you should not invest more than your 10% uh, of your free 
investment capital, whether that's money or time. And if you think that you would have to get 10% of your available investment capital to be invested into uh, up to 20 startups, not 20 at once, but 20 over time, it gives you the numeric perspective of, of how the portfolio investing strategy for investor works. So that is, that is the first thing for anyone considering investing that is good to keep in your mind. Uh, so that it's not, that gives the perspective that there should be a, a comparability approach instead of looking only at the individual. There should be balance consideration not to put too many investment effort into one company. Uh, and therefore that kind of those numbers should drive more of your thinking than the individual uh, activities of a startup. From that perspective, now you can then consider at what development phase would you be interested in getting involved. And therefore you can use the development phases as the primary uh, tool into, uh, into kind of considering where you want to and how you want to distribute your risk uh, through, this, um, uh, through these ventures. Now, if you are new to investing, then of course you need to pay your dues. So you need to kind of pay to learn and there's no better learning than the experience. So there you, therefore you can calculate, let's say, two to three first startups that you just agree to yourself that you will 100% not get anything back other than the learnings. So you are making the investments financially or time-wise to actually learn more and that's your kind of the tuition uh, payment. Uh, but with these perspectives in mind, you should get uh, much more different uh, uh, view into how you should evaluate startups because uh, it's important to understand the journey, the development phases, the statistical perspectives, because these are more relevant for investing, but then you actually have to get your hands dirty. You don't learn how to ride a bike by reading the theory and statistics. So, so you also, as an investor, you need to just start doing it, but understand and set your personal criteria, risk barriers, and then see with those what matches. And in addition, I would recommend to join business angel networks uh, and also collaborate with accelerators and support organizations that don't do investing uh, to, to, to build net, uh, relationship with them so that they also have statistical perspective when they identify something that is better than usual and uh, that, that, that they can make introductions and things like that. And then uh, also, if available, business angel networks usually do like syndicated investments uh, where you can join uh, a venture where there's someone else taking a lead investing position and you kind of learn along the way. Your risk is lower and you learn from the, the leading investors and you learn from the experience. Um, so those are uh, good approaches for that. But if you're considering doing like equity crowdfunding platform uh, as an ind independent investor, I would recommend to invest into products and services that you actually would use yourself or the markets that you actually know yourself. So a doctor making an investment into medical device in their area of practice. So that's the best advice when you are not doing purely from investor's mindset, but you are investing from as an individual then uh, invest in the base of products and services that you would use yourself or you know that in your industry that is actually a, a great solution. So a bit long answer but it was important to answer the, the statistical background information and perspective. Uh, so thanks for the great question. Um, so uh, other typical roles in the startups, in addition to core operative team and of course uh, shareholders, so investors as well, is, is then um, is 
is the other founding team members and partners. So if we think cooperative co-founders, those are the ones, those are like the parents of the child, so to speak. And then other founding team members, uh, they can be uh, advisors, they can be uh, some partners uh, that have some contributions, some IP they contribute, they can contribute some channels, some visibility. Um, accelerators can be something of this. Uh, and then of course, when, when the startups start to grow, there's other team members, employees. And, and then it's a question of how many of these are shareholders. Then the advisors, official board members, um, and, and then mentors. And these are just the different terminology and they become relevant at different de development phases. Mentors are always useful, advisors are always useful, uh, in the more so in the beginning and the early parts, but also later. It's more that, that they profile of what they are knowledgeable about and what their expertise is may change. So you may want to actually change the advisors uh, that, and mentors along the way, depending on what types of uh, questions and challenges you are working on. Uh, but at the same time, as a category, both of these are relevant uh, for overall uh, journey. When we look at the core co-founding team, typically these are the three main categories that should be really figured out and managed somehow. You need resources to be able to design. So if there's an idea, how does that idea look in practice? So whether that's a designing a user interface or whether that's designing the user experience or whether that's designing the communication material or whether that's designing the, the, the different things. Designers mindset and designers are very valuable in the way of simplifying and crystallizing and refining and reducing the, the, the waste and the unnecessary parts to get to the essence that needs to be built that needs to be communicated and so forth. So design is a key function that you should have in the co-founding team. Someone, the, the level of skills is, is, is something that if there's a young designer, if there's a, just the, the one who has really done design work, their mindset is important. The way they think that what they can do is important. Then there needs to be someone who can build it someone who can make it work. So whether it's a manufacturing a product or whether this is a, the coding, the, the service, whatever that is, someone needs to make that design work. Someone needs to make the product or the service function. And there's a clear collaboration between these two core capabilities. And then there needs to be someone who looks the pro business side, someone who is on the customer side, someone who is on the looking at the, the number side, the, 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 the account side, the processing side, the team building sides, the HR side, someone who looks after the, the, the mechanics of the, of the business. So of course sales is a big part of that, but it's also all the other processes. And with these types of three different mindsets, you can get uh, a balanced skill set uh, for the adventure. So if you have three business co-founders, you are lacking significant capabilities uh, to vet ideas, to iterate products. Uh, if you are miss, if you are three developers, you are missing the capabilities of on the customer front uh, dialogue, uh, the ability to design the use, user experience, uh, and so forth. If you are three designers, uh, it's hard to get those products out to the market and uh, depending on the market and depending on the product how important is individual of this key dimension varies also it varies on the on the journey of the venture but nevertheless these types of things you always need to have in any company and capabilities the closer they are into the core with those who can do who can not only have the mindset, but also deliver, the faster you can create your product, the faster you can iterate it into the market. The, the more you are missing this from the core co-founders, 
the slower it is, the more risk it involves. As co-founders in the venture, uh, it's basically in the beginning because there isn't, uh, isn't that many uh, people involved. It means that there are still a, a, a big number of tasks and activities that need to be done. So as a co-founder, you wear many hats. So in the, in, the, in the first level, you are, of course, expected to be an owner with significant stake uh, that comes with significant responsibility. So you, you have the company and the co-founders. In addition to being owners, you are the board of directors. So you are officially the ones who create the strategy who is responsible from the corporate as an entity, uh, collectively as board of directors. At the same time, you are the you know, CEO, CTO, CDO. Whether you want to use those terms or something more practical, uh, like designer, um, main de developer, um, uh, sales lead, whatever the terms that you want to use that are most fitting to communicate and have uh, a good dialogue with customer, uh, that is a strategy uh, decision on its own. But you are uh, uh, co-founders as managers as well. And surprise, surprise, you are also the resources, the first resources that are there to actually deliver on the actual work. So to actually design, to actually code, to actually sell. And, um, and it's not just how to um, create the strategy on how to design, how to develop, how to sell. It's not only to manage other people's doing it, it's also delivering it. But the key here is that you should learn to wear different hats so that you know in what role and what function are you operating at the moment and to, together with your co-founders. So have a separate strategy meetings, have com compared to operative management meetings uh, separated from what goes on into say your Slack channel or Trello board, which is more of the operative activities. Have time and place and clearly switch your mode, mindset and role. Um, so that you also learn how these roles should look like, how they should work, and involve external parties like advisors and mentors to help you get separation uh, in these roles. It's also important to look at how each of your uh, co-founders role, how do you see your personal growth in your team? Are you starting mainly as operative, resource and you always want to remain as an operative resource even with your significant ownership stake or are you starting as a operative manager and you see that you will need to become really good at operative manager and you will give up on your uh, delivery responsibility as operative resource uh, over time or are you looking to be the board of directors the chairman of the strategy, driving the strategy. Uh, and, and regardless of your other roles in the beginning, that's where you will see your long-term position and main responsibility to grow into. If there is no plan, again, if there is no discussion about the expectations, usually when those things then start to evolve, then there may be totally wrong expectations by other team members that, oh, I thought you always wanted to be a CEO and that's your long-term position or oh I, I thought you will become the CTO to manage the other developers where the person says no I just like to code I don't want to be a manager to other people so if these are not discussed then you don't know what type of team members you should be looking for and don't assume anything uh, without having these conversations and plans in place because that's exactly the organization development and planning So, what's your personal path? Initially, collectively, you handle all the roles, but uh, going forward, decide what your personal growth path looks like. It may even include that you 
only there for a certain amount of years and, and not expect it to work uh, all the way through. But then you should consider whether such a person is actually a candidate for core co-founder role. <clears throat> so when building the team, always choose to start and aim for the best. So don't look for people who are similar than you, who have similar skill sets, who are similar uh, trained, because that doesn't help you grow skills on the uh, other dimensions. So look for people who have better skills in areas where you don't have those skills. That's a good guideline. Use the designer, business guy, developer, um, or, or production uh, person as your as the kind of framework to help. Look for A-level people. There's this terminology that exists uh, where there's this A, B and C level people and seek for A-level people who are really typically motivated by the actual journey, uh, personal challenge, uh, the, the, the mission of the company rather than money. Um, A-level people seek to work with other A-level people who will challenge themselves and they can learn from each other and they can, in different, in different topics, uh, really challenge the other person's expertise and, and, uh, and they can collectively learn more. At the same time, they can be very humble in their, their approach because they are in this, in this uh, learning and execution mode. Whereas there's a certain category of B-level people who feel that for some reason they are already better than someone else. They, they sometimes without any merit think they are better and, uh, and basically to prove that they usually actually don't like to get A-level people and not even other B-level people to work with them, but they actually seek and want and who feel more comfortable hiring people or grow the team with C-level people where they can tell them what to do, how to do it, and at the same time look better than they are themselves because they're never challenged with, with, uh, with those who are in a constant learning and growth personal path. So maybe you can identify people that go into these categories in your, in your extended uh, family or friendship network or, or colleagues but uh, this is just to give an idea when you're building a venture of how to think about. So challenge yourself, seek people who can challenge you and that have different kind of skill set, but still skill sets that are valuable for the company. One question. Um, when you are building your team, how do you um, a value when people choose, for example, parents or friends, close friends in a team. So what about that? Yes, it's, it's a good question. So the answer is, is two-sided. There is no um, a good or bad or clear answer as such for, for because that should, it should always depend more on the skills and attitude and the personality than about the relationship. So it would be wrong to say that your friend or family member have um, um, some additional benefits because of, uh, because of your relationship. You should always look not what you need, but what the company needs. Uh, I don't know factual statistics, but based on my own experience, it's more common when people are driven by the, the company mission and things like that, that you can actually uh, find, well, you can find uh, good people that want to join and you become friends. You can become very close, close friends. Uh, but but some, sometimes the friendship doesn't automatically extend into becoming a good working relationship. Uh, because it's a totally different types of uh, working relationship. But there is no automatic answer. But then there's another perspective you can look at it, that if you are limited in finding and trusting people only in your network, you are going to be very limited in your capability to grow the organization. 
So if you think that you need to find a lawyer and you don't have a lawyer and you're choosing the second best, someone who knows a little bit of law, who are just uh, learning because you know them or trust them, that's not necessarily what you should be looking for. Also, if you think you should find 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, at some point you anyway need to learn to vet people without knowing them ever before. And actually, uh, it's easier than it sounds. And this way you are not limited by your close network. Use your network, use the network of your friends, of course, but, but uh, don't think that that method of trust is what you need to have always in place uh, because you are missing an opportunity and a skill set that you need to train yourself on. And then there's agreements that we cover here also with the shareholder agreement. The agreements are made to take a risk way and to help protect you in, when, in cases when there was a wrong decision or wrong choice made um, regardless whether they were family or not. But the, the tricky part with family members is specifically friends are still like somewhat uh, different category, but if you fail with your family member, it, it may be awkward then later on in your family, other uh, family dinners or extended uh, family gatherings that are not necessarily uh, beneficial because the reason why you did it was not necessarily uh, right. And the outcome may be wrong for the, for, for wrong reasons. Thank you. Okay, um, so moving moving along on the on the on the types of personality that you are you should be seeking for. Uh, so there's skills and attitude, and attitude is you of course attitude can be good or bad, but mainly if we think about attitude in a positive sense. Um, you need to find people who have this let's get it done attitude and a very positive attitude, um, uh, a problem solving mindset attitude versus just having great skills. Because the attitude overruns the skills in the long term. And because we are talking about long term in that sense, because you want to be successful, if you think about your venture as a child, a three-year-old child is not that mature yet. So a three-year-old company still you can visualize it as a, as a person and you can see it's not that capable yet. So usually it's a long-term commitment, long-term process to get something successful. I mean, think about all of the big names that you would like to name as a great example and think how, how old those companies already are. And they are only starting. Uh, most of them. So focus on positive attitude. Those who say, I don't know how it's done, but I will learn and we will get it done. We have a problem, let's figure it out, let's solve it. And not with someone, well, I don't know how to do that, therefore it's someone else's responsibility. Or my skills are extraordinary in this category, so therefore I don't need to worry about the, the um, accumulating skills or understanding of the category of that, that's someone else's responsibility. So those who have the right attitude will over time accumulate much more broader and useful set of skills than any expert in one narrow dimension. Uh, and therefore they can only be useful in that narrow dimension. And then if the, the, that skill set is no longer needed, they have a very limited uh, skill set. So, uh, about a part of, of uh, creating the company's essential, these foundational things. Uh, culture is, is, is one important thing. So, every company has a culture, actually every family has a culture, every building has a culture, every sports team has a culture, every country has a culture and so forth. So also, so any organization involving people has a, has a culture and since you are studying everything, you are creating everything from the scratch, you can also design the culture 
and I recommend you to do so instead of letting the culture become whatever it becomes because then it's uncontrollable. Um, let's say uh, a, a company that has, doesn't have a clear culture could be someone like Yahoo, for example. It's very confusing company to many, like what is it about? What do they actually do? And they have struggled to find success in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, uh, excluding their uh, original first kind of market entry. But it's only one piece, but culture is a very important, important part. Culture represents the values, uh, values of what company is about, uh, how it likes to operate, how it, uh, how it considers about customers, how it considers about its partners, how it's can taking into consideration all the team members, and so forth. So culture is designed by written values. But in practice, those, those values written down doesn't mean anything, but uh, it's a communication about the culture. So uh, to actually make the culture work, you have to actually live by behavior through those cultures. And if someone breaks the values or misconduct, you should act on that. Because if you don't act on that, it becomes a new unwritten value. Uh, organization. So culture is there to protect and to, to give uh, meaning for, for, for the organization. Then it's a separate thing what those values are to you, what they are in your company. There is no universal set of values. You should consider that from the perspective of what kind of values would be best ones for our vision, for our uh, customer perspective for, for our markets. What's missing? Is there a company missing that should have a certain types of values? So this is a tool in many levels. Here's just some sample set of values. These are actually from the very early days of uh, our uh, ProVC group uh, when we started. And it just gives uh, a very operational perspective here uh, into certain types of values that, uh, that we were uh, looking at in specifically for the operating team. Here's also uh, a sample set of uh, company rules. It's also uh, communicating about the essence of how we are. And, um, and, and these are Descriptive, they are guiding principles, they are not something hard written, but it gives a certain flavor into the type of values and culture the company has. And these are not also something that you couldn't change, so you shouldn't change, you should. These are all iterative items, uh, but the main point here is that you should have them, you should have something to iterate, you should have something to look at periodically and see, does this still hold? Is this describing us? Um, because these are the ways that you can reflect also your own thinking from the past and seeing how you are changing, because these are the slow, slow and, and, and uh, potentially um, risk items that may change and suddenly you see that, hey, if we ask from our everyone working with us, if we ask from our customers, do they think that they would see us like this? So then if we think about the, the, the team growth, it would be natural that there's more resources added to these different functions, uh, depending on the different journey development phase. But there should be the, the, the expertise available at core co-founding team level, for example, to vet who's a good developer, who's a good like capable uh, in business operations, who's a capable designer on a specific subsegment of design, and so forth. And then on the advisors, you have many types of advisors, so it's not that there is someone who can advise you on any specific any topic. 
and not everyone has to be experienced in building startups and ventures because you have also these this specific business functions uh, for example like a, a technical advisor uh, experienced in, in, in certain technology aspect a financial advisor experienced in helping figure out the finance the more they have worked with startups, even if they don't have their own exper expertise, the better then they understand the terminology, the language, the challenges. Uh, but even that may not be depending on how specific the problem, how specific the need, the question, the more you can, you can utilize uh, these things. But you should not think of just having one type of advisors, but considering advisors for specific need. And at the same time, also learn to limit their advice, separate from their expert, expert opinion of the matter that they actually know, and advice that is actually an opinion without having an expertise on the topic uh, itself. So this is, this is important to, to think uh, on how, how this, this, this aspect should be considered as well. So, Something about the team building, so actual activities. Uh, so typically, uh, one of the best sites uh, globally, when you're looking at specifically internationally, team members, of course, LinkedIn is very good and powerful to, to have dialogues. Uh, Facebook groups are good, good places. But really, to the point, actions, uh, this angel.co, uh, previously angel list and their jobs, uh, there's very uh, founder-minded people and different skill sets to, to network with or to post jobs. Then you should see for the founder speed dating type of events that uh, any, uh, any networking event in your, uh, in your uh, startup ecosystem or related act or industry activities is a good place. But it's even better if they have founder matching specific activities like founder speed dating or in search of co-founder in search of team members type of events where the whole event is just the whole point is to try to find co-founders or additional team members and if you are a developer guy and you are trying to build a team or you're looking to join a team then go to business events and go to designer events. Don't just hang up on the developer events because you don't come across the, the skill sets type of people that, um, that you should be looking to network with. And same goes if you're a business guy, then go to developers events. Go there to learn, go there to ask questions, go there to network. And don't just hang up with business guys asking from another business guy, where can you find developers? So it's really to, to put in yourself out there and going to places where, where the, the other potential partners are and not where the people like you hang out. Again, startup weekends and hackathons are also very good. So any events that are more geared to earlier phases, uh, the, the more likely there are people who are also uh, considering earlier phases. And uh, also one, one uh, key aspect is that you should look into um, open your mind also to the point that maybe even if you're trying to build your team, maybe you could consider actually joining another team. Maybe there's a potential if we you know, merge two companies together, we could have a stronger founder team. Um, so that could accelerate uh, basically both both companies progress specifically when coming from a small market there's one company building a you know project management tool another one is building another project management tool maybe they would be stronger if they would evaluate that hey we have designers you have developers what if we put these together and create really the, the best project management tool out there don't develop more project management tools. There's enough of them. I'll just use that as an example. Um, or do, if that's your passion and you think the, the ones that are, 
out there now are not working. And of course, then the, the pitch, uh, pitching and founder targeted events. Also, don't forget to do the basics uh, to really put posts out there, describe even the co-founder positions, put them on your website and, and systematically communicate them and, and promote them and remember to repeat them and, and uh, keep them out there and update them. And uh, this is also a very good, uh, good way to have communication about your company and your progress and uh, be active about it and work on till until you have figured this out and you have solved the need. Because again, this doesn't go away by just thinking, well, I will find my co-founders later. It, it, it actually gets harder. So having advised so many companies and founders and even seeing founders coming when they have already like half a million revenue and they say, well, I'm having challenges to scale, uh, like, like, and it's really hard to find someone to, to do this with me at this co-founder level. Uh, I can hire people, I can hire expertise, but I can't get anyone to care at the same level. And it, I feel all the pressure is on me. And because of that, I, I'm, I have challenges to get the company to the next level. And uh, it's, it's really hard at that time because you can't get anyone into significant equity stake without them having quite a bit of money to buy for that. And you don't want to give it out for free either. So you need to get, you then need to get into these structural considerations. There's always ways, but the whole point is that it gets harder, not easier. Have a clear role, need an offering. And, uh, and, and it's not only what you need, or it's actually not at all what you need, it's what the company needs, what the vision needs. And, and uh, also in a way that it, you want to find people who are aligned with the culture and attitude and all those other aspects. So evaluating the team, uh, this is more from the, you, you can do this your own, but also from, from how Externally, uh, investors, support people, financiers, other uh, advisors, mentors would, would validate or uh, evaluate uh, the team. So it's basically from uh, the team structure, skills balance structure, commitment level, attitude perspective, and the cultural fit. So even if there's a good defined culture in the company, but one of the co-founder team members constantly communicate in a way that it's off, then that's a clear signal that that's a problem. Going to be a problem later on that there's clearly a, a not right fit here. So not too many, but it's, it's pretty hard to get all of this uh, aligned and good and definitely impossible if not even considered. Uh, quickly about the titles, so, so titles, uh, there's kind of in titles I use a couple of different ways. One is that there are these titles that are just fun, you know, it's funny to have these titles and as a founder you have freedom to come up with whatever titles you want, but you should consider always business customer aspect and partner aspect, so you should have titles that actually are meaningful and make sense and people can find the right person uh, based on the title. And at the same time, those titles internally don't mean anything but the communication and labels in that sense. What are the responsibilities uh, and roles and activities that how you agree to play and take care of the company? That's like your family business. That's your co-founder's own way of how you agree on things. And you should separate these things, not let titles become the driver of issue among co-founders as, as you should have the title discussion in the context of what is individual growth paths. So even if someone takes on a title, doesn't mean that's their title forever. Uh, and at the same time, the titles are needed for, for customers and partners. 
not for your internal needs to define who you are and what you do. But of course, there should be alignment that if you are the CEO, then it's expected that, that uh, the, the types of activities and communication happening will go through that channel, even if you look at them then together as a team. Uh, 